Crouch. Find. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby together with Guinness. Hello and welcome as we start the wheels in motion of yet another edition of House of Rugby, brought to you by Joe, together with our very good friends at Guinness. Unlike our friends in the technology world, which as always are setting us huge challenges. Hopefully we're not too pixelated this week. Uh, Hask and uh, the Lord are back in the hot seat once again. And it's a great pleasure to have with us an absolute icon of the game. 100 tests for the Wallabies, a Super Rugby winner with the Brumbies, Western Force as well, of course, three European triumphs with Toulon before recently playing for Suntory in Japan. It is a hugely warm welcome to the one, the only, and I will always say your name with a, an Australian accent. It is, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Matt Giddo. You're a little bit like Dan Carter in many ways. It's Dan Carter, not Dan Carter, and you are Matt Giddo. I think in France they, they want to adopt it as a French name because it is French, so I prefer right. your Aussie Giddo. Right. I like that. W- were you Mathieu Guiteau in France? Was that a sort of um, a flam- flamboyant way to, to yeah. introduce yourself? Pretty simple, Matt. I think because no one, no one's Australian over there, so you want to keep, you know, your uniqueness. When I come back here, I'm Matthew. When I'm in, yeah. in France, I'm Matt. Matt Giddo. Right. Yeah. You're looking well. How are you keeping busy? What Thank what's you. what are the headlines in your world right now? Oh, I think everyone's is the same. Everything's just about the coronavirus. Um, every day you're looking for new updates, uh, hoping, praying that schooling goes back. This yeah. homeschooling has been. <laughs> it's a tough gig. Gee, it's a tough gig. So I'm just trying to keep busy. I've got a gym downstairs, so I use that as often as I can. I think yeah. I think everyone's the same. You just try and make it work. No one does the right thing, but you're just trying to get through. You, you've put a bit of time in on the hair as well. Is that just, uh, is that just to look no, good, play a, good? Or is it- <laughs> no, I didn't put a lot of time in it. There's not much hair there, but um, Kurtley Beal nominated me for one of the uh, – it was like a challenge, all those challenges were going around. Um, and I got nominated for a few and I left them and then I thought this one would catch on. Um, so I did it. And then as soon as I nominated Drew, Drew said, no, I can't do it. I've got TV. <laughs> so, so I died. I love it. How is Drew? Is he well? Are you two still? I mean, he's, he's in America at the moment, isn't he? Is that right? No, he's not. He was supposed no, to go. I was going to go over there. Yeah. So I think when he got his visa, the borders got shut. And then from there, he's, he's just been waiting, training, um, I think it's pretty tough for him because single bloke, he uh, he can't get out. He, he can't be much. <laughs> um, has he still got it in his training? I mean, is he because he's who's he going to play for? Is he in New York? Is that right? Or am I making this up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. New York. Yeah. And has he still got it? I mean, is he showing himself to be in, in good condition in the in the home training? He's all, he always has it. No, he's, no, he's looking good. He's trained pretty hard. Um, yeah. I think just the weekend lets him down. Monday to Friday, he's good. <laughs> <laughs> Saturday, Sunday, I reckon, like everyone. That's, that is very true. Um, that is very true. And what's happening with your with your career? Are you, are you done? Did I see something the other day that you, you've, you've packed up or are you going to have one more blast because you haven't had the farewell? No, I, no, I'm not after the farewell. I've just, I'm done in Japan. So for the moment I'm just training um, and I'm not sure. So Huey Edmonds, who's running a, a local team here with East Rugby, he's asked me to play. So worst case or best case, I'll be playing local footy but just yeah Japan for me I loved it it was great but I think three years was enough because I do it without the kids so it's just like you're you're over there you train you play but when you come home like your days off the stuff where you like to explore and get out you're kind of by yourself so it just got by the end of the three years I mean it was getting a bit long you were am I right so you were known as the million dollar kid when you came along you now that the billion yen Sort of mature <laughs> I saw, I saw elder a, statesman. Yeah. I saw an article that was saying that myself and DC were getting 1.1 million pound um, for the season. That's good work. Yeah. Well, I didn't see that. So <laughs> <laughs> a lot of these. Yeah. Have you sent? Have you sent off another invoice? <laughs> yeah, I said to my agent, I said, "Do you me? You take fifty percent here? Oh no, sorry, seventy percent." But um, <laughs> the, um, yeah, it's like I mean all those. Things about what they think players are getting paid, it's all like it's all bullshit in the end, really. I saw one about DC that he signed in New York. He actually came out and publicly just said, No, look, you're making this up. Never never like the media to to chuck a couple of bobs out and see what happens. Um, Gets, it's very, very nice to have you on. And there are so many things that we're going to talk about. I just want to very quickly reflect with 
Hask and Lord on last week's show um, because they both did a bit of homework and rewrote Rugby Union from top to bottom. I just wondered if you'd had any feedback, you two, and whether you'd had, um, you know, Gus Pichot saying, come and be in my gang, or Sir Bill saying, do you want to come and run the game alongside, or whether no one paid like, any interest? I saw I saw a few things that said, uh, from people, obviously just random punters, that were, were quite positive. And then I said to you that the... The head of governance and uh, procedures started, uh, wanted to jo- link in with me from Premiership Rugby League, so I thought I was going to the top. So, uh, no, I, look, I think from it, there's obviously been a few things written as well, and it'd be quite interesting to get Git's point of view of what he would do around Australian rugby, because I, I, I read something the other day about whether it'd be worthwhile just going back to individual countries rather than having a Super 14 or Super Rugby type franchise go back playing in your own country which would then lead to that world club the world club thing would work better and could you do a sustained actual could australia run a sustained uh competition through all the clubs in the country that would actually get as much support as doing all the jet setting around the around new zealand and south africa japan and, and argentina but um so that side of mine probably could be tweaked but i think i think it was well received yeah, I think it was what I see. Ask, did your fag packet get any pickup? Um, no, sorry. It was my, wife, my wife's asked if I need a heater in my extensive conservatory area in the uh, <laughs> fortress, fortress of solitude. Um, now, do you know what? Since the whole lockdown started, it I haven't really had... A, like, you would, I was trying to think, would more people be listening to podcasts and kind of reflecting and enjoying themselves? Or what's been going on? So I, normally, I kind of get inundated with kind of feedback, but I've had absolutely nothing about anything. <laughs> so... So, I mean, obviously, every time I ever try to be serious, no one gives a shit anyway. So I think that they probably... And also, I mean, basically, I've been dining out in your comment. uh, You wouldn't have seen this last time, but Alex, when I did my homework and delivered it, Alex, at the end of the show, went, well, that was actually great. You know, uh, know, even Hass, with his limitations, did very well. So (laughs) I've been... uh, And I said that to my wife. My wife went, she went, we all laughed. We had a laugh like Alex. Ha, ha, ha. And she went, what does he think your limitations are? And I was like, babe, I don't... But don't they want to go there? They could be... (laughs) It could be extensive. Um, There's was, a whole was, show in that. There is. But I was, so I've had, I've had no feedback at all. I'm not sure anyone's listening. But at the end of the day, as long as someone pays me for a fucking hour a week where I get to <laughs> shout at people and say what I want, <laughs> it's the perfect dream. Did you love your time in France? I mean, it went so well on the field. But did you feel quite at home in the sunshine with your bank balance rocketing with a, you know, a, view, <laughs> a view of the sea, playing with the best team in the world? I mean, did, did that fit comfortably with you? Yeah, it um, <laughs> even, except for the except for the, the money. So I, when I first went over there, I was no longer playing international rugby, so um, I couldn't really ask for much. But yeah, I mean, even now looking back at photos and holidays that we went, like as a family, or just winning those games, like the team we had, um, the fun we had, like away from the field, because we knew we could relax on the weekend. Because by the time Wednesday Thursday came. These experienced guys who just aim up and do their job and, like, in the end it was enough. And too long, I mean, Tins knows what it's like, Hass knows what it's like. Even you, you've been there, but these guys have really experienced the nightlife, I think, so it's a good spot. With Bernard Laporte, like, I, I never know whether he, he's a good coach or not because uh, the stuff I heard from Toulon, obviously he had an unbelievable team at that point, but he just basically sat back and let you do it. And the only time you actually really heard from him was when he, if you lost a game, then he'd come and shout at you and then leave you to fix it. Or because you had so many players, did you basically run that team yourself? A uh, bit of bit of like both. So I think he rode the French players pretty hard. Like in front of a video session, they miss a tackle, he'll say, replay. Then everyone will watch the, the missed tackle, replay, replay. You just keep going for maybe, it'd be probably... 15 tackles, and each time you're just sinking into your chair just, like, <laughs> wanting to move on. But he, after we played a game at Toulon um, and we lost at home, which is which is a bad thing. I mean, it's bad to lose at any time. But if, in France, if you lose at home, it's, yeah. like, it's pretty big. And uh, Johnny was rested for that game. It was supposed to be an easy game. And Bernard's come in and just singled me out. He said, you. He said, we'll never win anything if we've got you in our side. You can't tackle. You can't kick. No wonder Australia never picked you again. And he walked out. <laughs> I was sitting there going, shit. I don't know what's – I've heard how they just tear your contracts up. Yeah. Um, and then my mate just said, come with us. We'll just go to La Plage, which is like the, the local nightclub. 
So yeah, my, it's good. But I've been in there. It's nice. Nice. Yeah, I said, I, I can't really be seen there. Like the, the public, if they see you out, they think that you're not wearing that loss bad, they'll, they'll ride you for, for a long time. So anyway, he eventually convinced me to go around. I went to La Plage. As I've walked in, Bernard's there with a tie around his head. I don't know. He's just like <laughs> a guy that he's just like he really is passionate for that moment. It's done, and then he lets it go. And for me, I like that. I, I love hard coaches that just you worry about football. Okay, now we're at the nightclub. It's all over. Like, don't worry about it. Just enjoy yourself. We'll worry about it Monday. We Gloucester went there one sort of pre-season tour, and we had quite a good first 15 at uh, Gloucester. We, we went down and we sort of mixed it up for sort of 60 minutes, but um, it was all about rotation. It was unlimited subs. And we've brought in, we've brought on all these 18, 19, 20 year olds. We had like 10 on the bench and literally Toulon had 10 internationals on the bench and they ended up putting 60 on us in the last 20 minutes. And these kids were just going like chasing shadows going, who this? Who that? From the, uh, <laughs> where did that come from? As they were just running in tries with that. Um, but then, yeah, we went out when we, uh, we had a good night out with those boys because it was because obviously it was so international as well. It was just good to catch up with. I even got to catch up with Wilco, which is unheard of. It's like catching yeah. up with Scarlet Pimpernel. Even I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> did you did get did you did you like because obviously playing at Stad and like playing against you guys and then seeing back at Wasps and coming over and, and playing? Did you, did you appreciate at the time how like you almost had that perfect synergy between other international players that were so professional? but obviously good French players and that you were actually for the first time, everyone was kind of steering the ship. Cause one of the things I've always found is that say for example, when you go to Japan, you go to Japan, they get a foreign coach, sacks all the Japanese, and then they try and play a foreign way that fails. The next three years is all Japanese until they go around the cycle. Same thing in France, they get a foreign coach in, he upsets all the French, the French then get upset and they go full French. But in that period of like three years, four years, you kind of had the perfect synergy. Did you, were you aware of that at the time? Uh, not really. Um, I think the lucky thing, well, the thing that Morad probably did best um, was that he recruited um, guys at the end of their international career that still wanted to win. So they weren't just cashing in. They still wanted to win competitions, um, which is pretty rare. I think a lot of guys, when you recruit a lot of internationals hoping to buy a star team, you might get a couple of good performances, but you don't necessarily get a team that really wants to work for each other. I, when I signed there, I didn't think that we're going to win competitions. For me, I signed there because I had a mate playing at Toulon and it was a good part of France um, and I wanted to experience something different. Can I? There were so many things, so many threads to pick up on, but you're, are you very close to your dad? And I suppose having run on parallel tracks, the league and the union sort of career that, that he enjoyed and you've enjoyed, is that? Have you, have you had the old arm wrestle over that? Would, would he love you to have played league? Is he proud of it, all that you've done in Union? Is that is that an interesting debating point between the two of you? No, oh, he thinks Union's soft, like still, right. still now. <laughs> I think my whole family play league, so they, they think Union's soft, um, which is fine for me. But I think there was one time, I think it was 2015, when I was coming off contract, uh, 2005, coming off contract and the, uh, the Tigers called Dad up and they said, um, you know, we're thinking we want to sign your son. And he said, well, how much money you've got. He didn't even tell me what the offer was, but he just said to him, you aren't even close. And he just hung up. And then that was it. Like league was done. Like never, he never wanted me really to play it, I don't think. But I think he, um, it's probably the sport that we all watch as a family. I prefer yeah. to watch was that, that than rugby. Was that, be, was that because your big sister did, took one for the, of course she plays both, doesn't she? So is she close to your dad because she plays Aussie <laughs> rugby league? Favourite well. daughter. Favorite child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be the favourite. Definitely not. I'm the only <laughs> one that didn't play league. No, he, yeah, I, I mean, it is what it is. It's a sport I love, like I said, but it just never happened for me. So, yeah, I've been pretty happy with, with rugby. I find it watching the league, because when I've obviously been over to Australia quite a few times and I read Andrew John's autobiography and we watched the footy show and stuff. Like, obviously, in Australia, like, it, it is seen as the toughest sport by far, isn't it? It's like it's played by real men who, like, your arms falling off, your legs falling off, and they just go back on. Everyone's scrapping. Like, it's a sport. When I go over to Australia, it's what I watch over Union. So I can understand. It's, it's mad over there, isn't it? It's like, it's like part of the DNA of being Australian is, is the league. I think if you get knocked out, like, and, and you go off and you're done for a HIA, they're like, oh, this, he shouldn't be paid, this guy. <laughs> you know, like, I think 
But I even think that way when I watch league, whereas if I see a rugby guy get a head knock, oh, oof, gee, he should come off. Whereas when you're watching, <laughs> it's just the mentality. Like league is they get around, they drink their beers, they're at a pub. Uh, rugby, we have our red wines and, and our quiet <laughs> nights. Yeah. It's just a the way it rose, is. Eh? Extra ice. Yeah. yeah, it's just the way it is. It's, I, I'll never forget the Sam Burgess interview as he walked off at half time in the grand final. And I think it was Joey John said, y- Your cheek, his cheek had like properly imploded. He said, Your cheek, your cheek is your right. He goes, No, mate, it's fucked. And just ran off. You, you wouldn't necessarily <laughs> get that on, wouldn't get that on BT Sport. Um, yeah, each to their own. But your brother in law's, he's a big um, Aussie rules as well. Is it, is he, is it Lance Franklin? I mean, you, you've, got, yep. you've got some proper strong genes in, in the family line. Yeah, he, um, that's actually who my son wants to be now, which is, Disheartening. <laughs> he, um, he uh, always wants to talk, you know, with Buddy or kick a footy with him. So, yeah, I mean, even my wife, she played netball. So I think sport's just a, a big thing for us, which is good, especially now with this homeschooling. So to get the kids out and kick a footy or do something that I enjoy and they enjoy, it's yeah. good. But, yeah, he, um, yeah, he's a big deal here. You want to start worrying if your not, wife wants to go and play with Buddy, then you've got a few problems. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. she starts calling me Buddy in the middle of the night. Yeah, yeah. I've got to go a, kick the, with Buddy. You can't catch, yeah. babe. I've got to go, I've yeah. got to go. Kids want to see him. There's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot of confusion because Drew Mitchell is also your step in, He's a step in, stepfather to the children, isn't he? We were having a holiday in France and we had this place and we, we said, oh, why don't you... Uh, Huey was there and we said, oh, why don't you come up? So Drew came up and he brought and gets his family with, with him <laughs> I was like, well, where's kids? No, oh, it doesn't matter. So he's like a step in. He's a step in dad when gets is away. My second boy looks nothing like me and everything like Drew. <laughs> I, I would. Uh, Drew was injured for a long period, like in the maybe third year, and I'd call my wife, FaceTime home, and she have a cocktail glass. I said, what are you having cocktails by yourself? She just turns the glass. Drew's uh, turned the camera. Drew's just made his way up to have a drink with her. <laughs> but, mate, it's, is he wearing, um, was he, wasn't wearing your clothes, was he? <laughs> I don't know. But he, he, we've, we've, we've been he had his slippers on and was smoking a pipe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just nodding. What be, I knew what, what was going on. Um, the other thing I wanted to pick up on on your Toulon days, and it, it was very much you and Drew, sort of with Uncle Jay Bear at, at the top. Um, and just your relationship with Johnny. I think it's fair to say you and Johnny are peas from different pods, and yet there's. There's a there's quite a tight bond there. I mean, what did you make of you know one of the guys who is who is an English national icon? How well did you guys get on, and what was it like playing with him? Oh, it was unreal to play with him. I think before I went there um, in Australia, because of the time zones, you don't see much of like Six Nations or European rugby really, unless you're searching for it. And I would often like to watch league, but you get to the World Cups. I remember 2007. And Johnny, obviously, 2003, was kicking the goals. And all the highlights that I ever saw was just him kicking. I didn't think he was much of a player. And 2007, when they beat us in Marseille, there was one chance in the 22 where he got out and he tried to run, I think, play to Paul Sackey, could have been the winger then. And it was too flat and it went out. And I said, yeah, that's right, mate. Just kick it. That's all you can do. You shit at anything else. (laughs) And then I just ran off. I remember reading in his book about some Aussie smartass. All he ever said was, (laughs) about him needing to kick, and he was like, well, that's, that's all I need to do, and that's all he did do to beat us. But going to Toulon, I knew he was such a king and he was so good, but I probably underestimated how tough he was as a player, um, the skill set that he did have, and just the way he could control and run a game plan. Like, for me, it was perfect because I'll probably play a little bit more like what I see in front of me. If I've got to follow a game plan for 80 minutes, Mentally, for me, it's, I find it a bit of a battle, whereas that was Johnny's bread and butter. So for me, once we could trust each other and, and he could trust my calls, uh, things started to fall you know, into place really well. That's the big thing about, about Wilco, is if Wilco trusts the players around him, he's a completely different player. If he doesn't mm. trust the players around him, I've played in games for England and other games, where he doesn't, and he'll take it all on his own shoulders because then he feels it's all his responsibility. But that Toulon team where you could see, people say, oh, he's playing the best rugby because he's in the sun. And this It's because of the players around him, he had 100% trust that they would do the job. And that's uh, that's why it worked so perfectly. Well, well I thought it worked so well, perfectly for them. I think the first time I got there, he, he probably didn't. It's not that 
because he's such a nice guy and he does, like he's just so approachable and friendly with everyone. But I think once you get on the field, he worries so much about every decision and about someone judging what he did was wrong and not playing the perfect game. He'll even say it now. It probably limited him, you know, in him actually expressing himself. But the first, uh, could have been maybe the third game in, I saw the back left corner was free and I was outside of him and I said back left corner, back left corner to kick. But the phase was before he'd seen that the winger was up on the right side. So he caught it and then he just kicked uh, to that right angle, uh, back to the right side and the wingers caught it. But in that phase, the winger had obviously, obviously readjusted. And I noticed as time went, the calls that I'd give him, play wide, not kick it long, and they were <laughs> starting to, to work for him, I could feel that I was starting to get his trust a little bit more. And then from there we, um, you know, as Tin said, like his game just goes to another level because he doesn't have to worry about everything else outside him. He can just worry about controlling the game, which he's so good at. Amazing. Hask, what did, how did you find play? Because you would have been a young one coming through. Did, did yeah. he have the aura when you were up on the rails? Yeah, but actually, you know, I mean, you wouldn't have known for my skill set playing, but I used to spend a lot of time with Johnny, like doing extras after training all the time. Um, you know, like he would, he would, he was brilliant. Like he was someone that, um, you know, like when you're in a, in a team, obviously people have an aura about them, but you don't. You know, as, as players, you're obviously respectful, but you don't like play up to that or you don't try and, you know, make it awkward. So I would just bust it straight in. It was like, Wilco, you know, start giving him shit. Like, you know, and I said to him, listen, I said to him, look, I'd love to improve this. Can I prove that? Can I do this? And he would really help me. And we'd spend lots and lots of time together doing that extra work. And I was sort of in awe of his, his work ethic. But I was always very surprised because it was very clear to see that he, I don't think he necessarily enjoyed most of what he was doing or he was in his own head a lot of the time and you know he would always train so hard in the week that I would I would sort of you know speak to him, say Johnny you know like do you ever just get into games start you know not feeling that fresh because he'd, he'd flog himself <laughs> every day yeah. and then you turn up tired and it was something that I did earlier um sort of in the middle of my career you know I was going to see Margot Wells I was doing uh, I was doing wrestling to help my tackling I was doing extra fitness I was doing mobility I was doing everything by the time I was getting to, to the game I was absolutely fucked and someone took me to one side and went you know all the training in the week, all the stuff, all the weight you lift, everything all, doesn't matter if you don't get it right on the weekend. Nobody cares. You don't win anything for training really hard. And it was like, Christ, I know it's such a simple thing to say, but it kind of dawned on me. It was only about four years ago, Johnny and I were at a, were, were at a wedding together and I took him to one side and we having a really good catch up. And I said to him, look, be honest with you, did you actually enjoy, because he's been a lot more, he's been much more vocal in the recent years about kind of mental health issues. I mean, I said, did you enjoy it? And he said, you know what? I enjoyed uh, whistle at the start of a game, and I enjoyed the whistle, at the, uh, and, and and then the whistle at the end of the game. Everything else, not really, and was really kind of open about that 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 mentality, saying that he didn't really enjoy it. And that's what I always found hard because because I felt him so talented, so hard working, but you could clearly see that he just wore everything. And I, and, and that's what I was going to ask Matt, but he's kind of answered it. Was was you know did did he notice that he, he was so intense? Because I would have. It, you know, obviously they thrived over there, but I could just see a lot of the time he was in his head so much that, you know, that his career has gone so quickly. Did he ever look back and say, do you know what? I was, I was top of the world for such a long period of time. I really did enjoy it because I don't think he did for a, lot, a large part. No, he didn't. I, I would even tell him like on say captain's run, he's still flogging himself. I said, Johnny, you need, you need to rent. Like you don't need to be doing this much. Like you, have you ever been into a game fresh? And he said, I can't because if I don't put the work in, Mentally, I, like for the game, I'm, I'm going to be doing things like at 70%, 80% because I haven't done my 20 drop kicks or my 50 goal kicks or kick for the line. Like every little skill he needed to tick off in his mind so that he knew he could, he could do it at 100%. He's addicted to process. He, he has to – He has. that is how he divides his mind up is he has to – like I used to, I was his kicking partner for all through the early 2000s. And, you know, you're staying two, two and a half hours. I would stop, but I'd still have to wait for him to finish. Um, and it was, and he'd always finish. If he didn't hit 20, what he called zeros or arrows on his drop punts, he goes back to, he goes back to the start and he starts again. Then once he's doing his 20 on his right, he does 20 on the left. If he doesn't hit 20 in a row, he just starts again. And it's just, it was just mindless how dedicated and how he could how he couldn't get bored of it and just yeah. repeating that process over and over. Did you ever manage to drag him into one of your Sunday pit sessions and get him with a cigar and his wife fronts and, and a stubby? Or was that a push too far? 
You, is that to me or to Git? Well, to, 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 to me, I don't have cigars. Uh, right. Yeah, I've said to Johnny, yeah, when he had his, te- his testimonial and everything, and he had like Martin Johnson on stage and and uh, Clive, I'm like, <clears> why <throat> have you got those on stage? They're, they're not going to tell you anything good about you. And he, I said, get me and Bolsh on stage, under 18s tour to Australia. Great, some great stories about you. Got great stories about you from the early 2000s. He goes, that's why you're not allowed on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I once but told him a story about the Spice but, Girls, and he didn't. He didn't want that being told at all. That was shut down very quickly. <laughs> because I, he obviously, I played with him at eighteen schoolboys. We went on that tour, and it was quite a loose tour. We had some great lads on there: Andy Beatty, Bolsh, uh, Dave Flatman, Lee, Lee Mears. So people, Mike McCarrick, and people like this who love going out. So as you do, it's a schoolboy tour. First time in Australia, eighteen years old. You're billeted. You're going. You, you're getting in amongst it. You are going out and exploring the world you're in like Toowoomba you're in uh we're in the uh we're up in uh, Darwin so you, you, you're going and experience everything you can possibly see and then obviously we came back and in, in that 98 he immediately he got his first captain knee off the bench at, at, as wing yeah and then we all co- sort of caught up in 2000s and finally got capped and caught up with him and through that period he would go out after every international with everyone would have a whale of a time, great thing. And he, I don't know if he said it in his book, but he, it was the cinema in like 2001 where suddenly he just went, he did that advert with David Beckham and he just went bang like this. And I think from then he said he went to the cinema and he noticed everyone noticing the fact that he was at the cinema. And then that completely changed him and he just stopped going out. And then that's probably a lot more where his obsessive can Obviously he was obsessed from the start because he had Dave Allred since he was 16. So he knew that there was a lot to build on, but I think that's where that's where the good stories that I've got finished. I think uh, but, yeah. one for another day, one for another day. Um, Matt, can we go back to the start of your career? And we're talking about sort of people who had it all on their shoulders at an early age. In terms of Johnny, that was exactly the same with you as well. What do you remember of of I suppose breaking through the expectation, the pressure, um, and being part of what was. I mean, arguably one of the finest super rugby teams in that ACT Brumbies outfit that um, did the back-to-back titles. I think when you're when you're young, I don't really think about the pressure. So I I didn't even have a super rugby contract. So no super rugby team was scouting me. It's just Eddie saw me train for the Aussie Sevens one day, and Eddie Jones just came down and told the coach. He said, "I I like the way he trains," and I can't even remember what we did or what I did. Um, but off the back of that, I got picked on a Wallaby tour. Like it was weird, re- really strange. So I didn't even know my – I didn't even know guys from my state. So I'm meeting everyone for the for the first time, just nervous, like 19, no money. you got to pretend like you got money because they've all got money. Um, but from a football point of view, I didn't have time to think that it wasn't normal. Like it was just I was picked for a team, so I got to play and I, my first cap was against England – um, at the time, Eddie Jones had a system <laughs> for your plus and minus, a good pass, plus a uh, missed tackle, minus, good kick, bad kick, uh, whatever. I'm the only player to finish in the minuses. I think after 10 minutes I was <laughs> minus four or something. So it was, yeah, I think that was kind of the big wake-up call for me when I got my first test. I was like, shit, like this isn't my level. Like I'm, I'm not at this level yet. Um, and as soon as the tour finished, most players get a holiday, but Eddie sent me straight back to Super Rugby. So then I had to sign for the Brumbies because um, I was in Canberra and, yeah, I was just lucky that I was in a good team. Did you have like, – sorry, Alex. Did you have yeah, with Eddie – was it was it old Eddie? Because, you, know, like, you know, there's like – you need to talk about like the rebrand because obviously there's like old Eddie – there's like ruthless, like <laughs> stink eye will fucking kill you, Eddie. And then there's the new Eddie that we that we see where he doesn't kill anyone. Did you did you have? Oh, was that old Eddie? I, I see Eddie in Suntory. He'll come to Suntory when I was there. I still get old Eddie. He sees me <laughs> as that 19 year old. Get away, mate. And I'm just like, shit. How do I feel? Do I feel good? Do I feel bad? I don't know how I feel. Because <laughs> you know, if you said, <laughs> is, is it? You know, oh. you know, if he said to you, if you went, you went, you went, gets how are you, mate? And you went, oh, I'm a bit tired. Fuck's wrong with you, mate? We don't tired, want tired mate. people. Tired, yeah. mate. We don't want tired yeah. people. Go home if you're tired. Yeah. And if you say but, I feel good, oh, you're not training hard enough, mate. <laughs> it's like, fuck. <laughs> what do I do? Yeah, he. Uh, he it's, do you do quite a good yeah. impression of Eddie? Can you give us a spin on that? Oh, I've been known to do not a bad Eddie. (laughs) 
Have you ever Every used it in then. a sort of in a broader context beyond just uh, an ale around a around a fire pit? Yeah, well, I did one for Rugby Pass about my twenty first when he was telling me. So he pulled me aside and he, he said, "Get, I know it's your twenty first, mate, um, but you're not to drink. We're in the middle of World Cup prep." And I said, "Yep, yeah, no worries. Like I don't care. Like I don't I don't want to drink. Doesn't worry me. Like I'm here for the team." And then they put on a big cake and a big do that night. And um, the boys can't say, you want a beer? I said, no, no, that's all right. Like, we've got training tomorrow. He goes, get, have a beer, mate. Be with your <laughs> friends, mate. Relax. So I'm just going, what do I do here? <laughs> like, he just told me at training not to have a beer. And I said, look, no, it's fine. Like, I won't have a beer. And then one, he just goes, get him, get him a beer, mate. He'll have a beer. So they got me a beer, put it down in front of me, and I was just like, what am I doing? Is this like a test if I'm going to be in? <laughs> But he would constantly, like, just use that stuff, like, always with me. Like, at training, I oh, get fucking nice pass, mate, great pass. But then as soon as everyone would leave, he said, got to work on your tackling, mate, not good enough. So, like, everyone would think I'm this pinup boy, but he would ride me, like, all the time, send me a message, have you been doing this, are you doing that? Um, but in front of everyone else, it looked like I was this pinup boy. So it's still, even now when I see him, even now, like my heart races when I think about it. Like if he walked in this room here, <laughs> I'd stand up and just give him a chair and say, yeah, mate, talk to the boys here. Mm. Unbelievable. That, did, did he get the best out of you by doing that or do you feel that it's sort of the, the indecision and the, the questions of sometimes hampered you? No, definitely. He got the best out of me, especially from, as a young age. Like I was still trying to learn the game. He, he gave so much information. Like before mm. this New Zealand test, uh, I didn't even know I did it, but at training I, I went forward and then cut across and it just allowed the defence to chase and Sterling would drift under. He said, that's the line, mate. That's what I want. And I never even thought about it, but going into that game I just thought about manipulating defenders that way and it helped our team. Like he was just really good at the small detail. And when you're a young guy, like trying to learn the game, he was he was unreal. How is, would is that why fed under old age? Oh, I think he loves Husk. He's the only player that I think he said he likes. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did. I, I just wonder how Hask would have fared under old Eddie. I mean, it would have been it would have been a two minute conversation, wouldn't it? Oh, I, well, I had a mate that got called. Matt Henjack got called up. His first Wallaby um, selection in the squad, and he said, "Well done, Matt. You've made the squad." He said, "Oh, thanks, champ." He's gone, champ, <laughs> champ. <laughs> Do you respect anybody, mate? I'll see you in two days. When he got there, he didn't last long. Like that camp, he got flogged. Yeah, I mean, you know, Why if you're you nervous, though. I don't know if you're nervous. Like I've tried to call him sir. I don't know. You, when you talk to him, you panic. He's just gone, champ. Right. He's gone, champ. <laughs> <laughs> didn't work. What a fuck up, though. What a fuck up. Like, I, I, like yeah. Obviously, like, Eddie's got a few nicknames of us, but you're right. As soon as he comes in, I'm like, yes, Mr. Jones, Eddie said, thank you, sir. Thank you. You know, because I, like, just like you, I get like, you're like, Hess, mate. Oi, you're looking good, mate. Oi, people, these guys said you're old as fuck, mate. You're looking good, yeah. mate. And then and then I get a text later going, see, authors, mate. We need to work on your jumping. You can't fucking <laughs> jump, mate. <laughs> and then, or I get a text and we start to go, mate. You need to go and speak to Dean, mate. We need to speed you up, mate. You're looking like a fucking cart horse out there. And then I go next day, he goes, good, mate. Looking faster. I was like, fucking up. It's going to be fast, one session. Mate. mate, fast, mate. I love it. <laughs> it, it was just like, but honestly, because you wanted to always go and improve. Like, you, you'd honestly, I'd be like that. He'd call me, go, Hess, mate, need to come and see you. Be like, how are you? I'd be like, good. He goes, you know, mate, you can do this. You can do that. Do you know how good you could be? This is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. And I'd be like, yes, sir. And he'd like, give you the tools to go and do it. <laughs> and you go mm. and work on it. But it was always like that tentative because I, I naturally want to like build a relationship. But you always, I think it's always important to have like, you know, good uh, relationships with coaches and players, but to never stop, step across that mark. For example, calling him fucking champ or, or do, you know, yeah. I like give him a little bit of shit, but not too much shit because you just don't want to accidentally see the, you know, that, oh, Matt, Matt, are you fucking serious? He's <laughs> all right, he's yeah. He this. just loves the mind games. I mean, it's not, I can tell you from personal experience, and not just players, but I've done Q&As with him on stage in front of four or 500 people. This is when he first came to England and we did 15 minutes where he gave only one word answers. <laughs> Which, you know, I, I'm quite comfortable firing questions at people. But when you've got an audience who want to hear from one of the great coaches, it's just before you won your Grand Slam, one word answers and no more. But it's, I mean, do, do, you, do you hear from him now at all? Obviously, you know, he, he's got he's got a darling with Suntory, hasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he still comes yeah. out there. And um, 
yeah, I still speak to him. He's like, how's the, how's the club? How's things going? He doesn't sleep. Like, like after they won the grand final, uh, uh, George Gregan said he, he went to see him at both at Suntory. They wanted to go have a drink together. And he said, oh, mate, have you seen what they're doing in Georgia, mate? Some interesting stuff around the malls. He's going, switch off. Enjoy your, enjoy the grand final. Like, I just think some guys and coaches in particular are just built one way. But Eddie in particular, he just loves his rugby, like lives for it, and he just really enjoys new things, bouncing with players. And I think he enjoys throwing people off, like yourself or me or whatever. Do you know yeah. um, he talked about him not sleeping? So you know he's got that little dog, Annie. <clears throat> Right, so like every, every everyone always says, right? Oh, you know, Eddie doesn't sleep. He's got a mad work ethic, and it's a hundred percent true. You know exactly what you said. That's why I, I always admire people who want to, you know, develop themselves the entire time. So as soon as the tournament's finished, he's looking at other coaches, other players. How to, how how can he improve? Dismantles the whole setup. You know, looks at different ways of like even from the the way players are eating to how self reliant they are. But I obviously a lot of times you get a text message like four in the morning. So I get up for a piss in the night because I'm getting older. You know, you're weeing like three times a night. And you see a text and it's like, I'm not sure I should reply to that because is it a good thing that I'm up at four or is it not a good thing? So I okay. ignore those. But sometimes you'd go and, you know, you'd say you had been sleeping or you've been awake all the time, right? And you go and knock on his office door and you'd knock on it and you'd just hear this like scuffling noise. And then he'd be up and you like 100% he was sleeping in the dog's bed under the desk. 100%. <laughs> Little, oh, like, it's the, the same pen. size. Uh, as Annie, and he was fucking asleep under there. And uh, you, you come in, he'd be like, "Oh man, I lost a pencil under the desk." Because I'm like, fuck <laughs> off, Eddie. You've been asleep in there, mate. Don't you know? But it's good PR, isn't it? If, if, if everyone thinks you never sleep and you never rest, it's a great story. Okay, well, let's take a little break just to remind you you're watching House of Rugby, brought to you by Joe, together with our very good friends at Guinness. My name is Alex Payne, alongside Haskin Tins, and the one, the only. Mr. Met Giddo this week. A pleasure to have him in the hot seat. We've got lots more to discuss, of course, the state of Australian rugby, what Matt's going to get up to in the not-too-distant future. But in the meantime, don't forget to check out our House of Rugby short series, which is out every Thursday during the lockdown. We've got 20 minutes of good old-fashioned rugby conversation with a different guest each week. We had Mo Hunt on fine form last time out, talking about the 2021 World Cup and dishing the dirt on quite a few of her teammates as well. Also, make sure you download a new podcast from Joe, which is called Sports Pages. And this digs into the stories behind some of the greatest sports books ever written. Episode two is out right now. And that is talking to John Feinstein, the author of the 1995 William Hill Sports Book of the Year, A Good Walk Spoiled, Days and Nights on the PGA Tour. Have a listen to this. I still remember that first morning at the 93 Ryder Cup there was a two hour delay because of fog and and the greens were still too cold. And finally the matches began and Davis Love and Tom Kite were playing against Sebi Ballesteros and Jose Maria Olathabal, arguably the greatest Ryder cup team in history. And I was following the players toward the first tee. And of course we were walking through, you know, an alleyway of fans on both sides. And I remember Davis kind of walking back to me and saying, I've never been so scared in my life because the, the pressure was just so intense. You know, there's a saying uh, among golfers that, that when you do something wrong, you threw up all over yourself. I had a six footer and I threw up, meaning you choked basically. And at that moment, Davis wasn't so much worried about choking. He was worried that he was going to get sick on the fairway in front of millions of people watching on television and watching live because his nerves were just so out of control. It was amazing. He was able to draw the club back. You're watching the House of Rugby on Joe, together with Guinness. Okay, well, that is John Feinstein talking about his classic book, A Good Walk Spoiled, in episode two of Sports Pages. I certainly know what he's talking about uh, in that regard. And that is available on your podcast apps. And episode three is out next Tuesday as well. Don't forget our Facebook group. We've got almost 40,000 of you in there now joining in the conversation. We've got Instagram for you, at Rugby Joe for photos, news, and behind-the-scenes bits and bobs. And we've got at RugbyJoe underscore UK if you are a tweeter. But um, let's get straight back into it. Matt, take us back to those Brumbies days. Um, and you, I mean, you mentioned Sturlo, but also, you know, Gregan, Larkham, George Smith coming through as well. I mean, that was one hell of a team. What, what are the memories of, I mean, arguably, you know, the greatest super rugby team that Australia's had? Oh, just good memories. I, it was weird because a year before... I'd go out and have beers and watch them play, like on the hill, and then like give it three or four months, and I'm training with these guys going on end of season tour. Like, 
the whole experience was just surreal. Even now, like Joe Roth uh, was a fullback, Andrew Walker, um, as you mentioned, those other players that I – these are guys that I'm training with every day, helping me with my lines and how to manipulate people and – it was the best school ever. Like it, and they were they were locals. Like they, so, for me, it was just I don't know. I was just lucky, really lucky. Did you always feel very comfortable at that level? Was it was it sort of to the manner born, or did you find yourself having to adjust to, you know, World Cup winners all around you and, and guys who were right at the pinnacle and at the peak of the game? No, I, I never feel like I belonged or comfortable for a long time until. Uh, Super Rugby probably felt um, more comfortable earlier because I could string together a couple of good games. Um, but then being able to play a kind of dominant role in a test match, I couldn't do for a long time. So, yeah, it took me a while to feel comfortable. Even now when I catch up with, say, George Gregan or Sterlo, like Sterling, Sterlo, I still see yeah, these I... guys as when I was young. So you, you respect them, you still feel a bit nervous, you want to say the right thing, and then after a few beers you can relax. But... For me, there's always that first level of respect that you, that you owe them because, yeah, I don't know, it's just the way I, I, I've idolised them, I suppose, being a local here. Yeah. Tins, I, I, we've spoken a lot about teams that you've played against in the past, but what, what, what was it that defined playing against Australia when Gitz was in there and Gregan, Larkham? You know, what, what, were the, what were those games like and where were you tested in perhaps ways that other countries didn't? I think what Australia, I've said this before, what they were always amazing at is is they always could figure out a game plan that they thought would work against England, and generally it did. Um, and they I always look at sort of the Institute of Sport as it was back then and how professional they they were and how much how dedicated they were to their craft. And that always sort of was the side that came across to us but I say when I was very lucky that when we when we sort of start when I started playing Australia those early years we, we didn't actually lose which but you could still see that's not true the, the, so, <laughs> I mean, no for, for, for my for my first few years then obviously after that it did but you, you're still looking at history and the history that came through against England Australia it always had a bit of edge a bit of niggle uh, had they had such world class players at the time. Obviously, with with Gitz, George, Gregan, Roth, all the people we've we've been through, Sterling, even before that, with Timmy Horan and people, you know, they were sort of the pinnacle that you were always chasing for for us after um, so after ninety nine. I just what I always loved was Australia. You always enjoyed after the games as well because you would get rinsed. the The verbals that were on the pitch were intense some of the best but then after the game every Aussie always wants to have a beer with you and actually get to know you uh, whereas you can't say the same generally about uh, Kiwis or really South Africans whereas Aussies will grind you verbally and try and grind you on the pitch but then after it you you catch up and you make mates which I, I mean I've got quite a lot of mates uh, who, who I used to play against for, for the Aussies so where, where does Gitto rate in the verbal bombasts I actually, I don't, it wasn't really. I would never talk to him. I remember when I first came in, looking at him, I was just like, "Just don't make him angry. Don't make him angry. Just try and <laughs> try and tackle him somehow." Uh, I wouldn't have said a word. We we didn't have like Greeks. Obviously, scrum halves are always. Um, you had uh, JP, <clears throat> Jeremy, Paul, Gobby. You had uh, who was the who was the eight? Kefu. Todd I Kefu. Yeah, there was Kefu, but who was the I mean Justin Harrison. Well, we know he'd give it he he give out a bit, <laughs> but what, I wasn't thinking about him. He'll come he'll come to me. And then obviously Sterling Mortlock and I always had a few words uh, which oh, was always Owen good. Owen Finnegan. Owen, Owen Finnegan. Finnegan. Yeah. Literally Melon. Was he called so, Melon Head yeah. or something? Melon. Yeah, yeah, he had a massive melon to be fair Um yeah. So it was that side of it, and that's part of the battles that you really enjoy. You enjoy it when there's a bit of verbals there as well. I mean, I didn't really give out loads because I was like, well, I'll just get my job done, and if I do my job and we win, then I'm happy. Um, mm. But uh, there's a lot of people, obviously, scroll, like Dawson, and that jump into it, uh, Delalio, Backy, Backy's all over it. I think that's what makes those games special. It's the same if you, you know, with Wales or anything else. It's when you can get really... It's more than just rugby, and I think that's what England have always had against Australia. Um, Matt, can I ask? Can I ask you about World Cups? Obviously, it, it, you know highs and lows, etc. But you're wearing the right smile. Oh three 
is, is the is there a medal somewhere or is it all gone in the bin? And what what do you remember of of the um, day that up yeah, here we all celebrate? So yeah, medals with my with my parents. Um, obviously disappointing. Um, I remember just coming on and off because Stephen Larkham got a cut above his um, his chin that just wouldn't close up. So I had to keep subbing on and off for him. So you couldn't get any type of rhythm. I think my first carry, uh, Johnny smashed me, like picked me up, um, dropped me down. But then my next carry, I bumped him a little bit. And I think he had neck issues at the time. And he was stinging and he was down for a while. Um, and I was thinking, this is great. Like I'm going to be a hero here. Didn't, <laughs> didn't turn out that way. But um, after the game, like I, I was really disappointed. But... It was my first year in international football, first real year, and I thought, this is pretty easy. We've got, like, a good team. We'll, we'll get a next chance in, in four years. Then again, quarterfinal, things were going well. We got knocked out uh, by England again. Uh, 2011, I didn't make it, and I'm in France. So I just thought, shit, like, you don't really get too many cracks at it. Um, yeah. And I was thinking that so was So when it came around again in... When it came around again in 2015, I mean, again, it was an amazing story and you played some incredible by, by the final, obviously. But is that did you treasure 2015 more because of missing out in 2011? Yeah, massively. Yeah, like 100%. Because also my kids got the opportunity to watch me. They were an age where they still remember now that, like, I could pick them up, walk around the stadium. They saw me playing for my country. They went to some big games, which they remember. So just memories like that were were quite special and I think because I'd been out of the game for four years, not that you ever took it for granted, but when you picked week in, week out, even if you weren't playing sometimes well, you you kind of just assume it's going to keep happening. But once I was out for four years, when I first got picked to play for the Wallabies and and you're back um, representing your country and you see what it means to people, then, yeah, I think I, I did appreciate it like, so much more. Not that I ever took it for granted, but I really appreciate it. Just going back to obviously missing out in 2011, I heard you talk about what um, Eddie Jones was as a coach. I've heard that Eddie, sort of Robbie Deans was slightly on the other side of it. He was more, you wanted someone who you'd be used to, like Eddie, telling you what you needed to do if you've had a good game, what I need to work on, what's right, what's wrong. Whereas he wasn't that sort of coach. He was more of a want to be your mate type coach, push you in the right way of always saying you've had a good game, you wouldn't change anything. Is that sort of where, did that relationship fall apart on the back of that or was it? I mean, now I've even seen him in Japan and and we're certainly better than we were and I'd happily have a beer. It it just got to the point where I would ask him, even leading into after the Super Rugby, we were playing Samoa, which we lost in Australia. And before the game, I was like, is there anything you want me to focus on, anything you want me to work on? He said, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. And then as soon as he told me that, I was thinking, shit, I think I'm, I think I'm on the outer here. Um, and then that was my last test under him. So, yeah, it was just I understood what he was trying to do because we, he brought in a lot of younger guys and he wanted them to feel comfortable. But the way the Australian rugby had been previously, when I'd come in, the senior guys would show you how to behave and tell you how to behave. Once you're on the field, you knew your role and you just execute that. Once Robbie came in, he wanted everyone on the same peg, on the same level, didn't want us driving standards, wanted us all to be accountable uh, for our own actions, which off-field probably we slipped a little bit, but it certainly helped develop the younger guys quicker, but it shifted a lot of guys, especially the older players. We got moved on pretty quick. Did you, you send a, am I right saying you sent a tweet saying, thank you, Bull Boys, thank you, Linesman, that's it, after the, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, do, do you have any... I don't suppose you're someone that looks back with regrets, but do you do you have regrets that you didn't go? Do you have regrets that you couldn't build the bond with him or is it just water under the bridge? Uh, move on? No, I don't have regrets I couldn't go because I'd been selected for however many, 10 years before that, even if I hadn't performed. So I understood what he wanted to do and the, the direction he wanted to take and that's fine because you, as a coach you live and die by your selections and he didn't want me, that was fine. It was just the way it was handled. So I, I was flown up from Canberra to Sydney um, to be told that I wasn't there. And like in the corner was uh, one of the um, one of the staff getting changed. They'd just come back from South Africa. He's taking his pants off. He's in his undies. They're unpacking, strapping and everything else. And Robbie's sitting here just saying, we've gone with a 17-13 split. I said, okay. He said, so you're not in. I said, okay. I said, why did you fly me up here then? 
I said, this is embarrassing. You flown me up here to drop me. He said, no, I, I tried. I wanted to do it out of respect. I said, if, if it's respect, then we get a room. It's just us. See, you've got people coming and going. I can't say anything. And then uh, he said, oh, anyway, that's what's happening. I said, can you book me a flight out, please? He says, oh, well, we've got you going tomorrow. And that night was the launch, like all the players getting together in their suits for photos. I said, mate, I want to get out of here. So um, I then got out of there. And as I was waiting for the taxi to pick me up, I sent that tweet. um, And I nearly actually got fined for that because I released news before the squad had been picked. So, I mean, (laughs) that would have been anything. If I got fined for that as well, then... (laughs) <laughs> that would have left a sour taste in my mouth. But, yeah, I mean, it is what it is and I'm past it now. Like I got over it pretty quick. I think it was the best thing for me. I got to go to France and play for Toulon and, yeah, it turned out to be a bit of a blessing. But, yeah, it was just that period in particular. I didn't handle it well. I didn't act very well. I acted pretty bratty but it was also just, I don't know, just not, yeah, yeah. just not a good situation. And the last hurrah under Checker. I mean, we've spoken to Hask many times about Checker. Um, everything from what was the song you used to play at training? It wasn't Back in Black, but it was Smoke yeah, of the Water yeah, or something. Um, I think no, TNT was it? TNT. That's right. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. just looked like a lot of fun to be part of that Australian crew in in 2015. Hask will disagree, obviously, with the flambe dive in the uh, in the corner to knock <laughs> England out. But it just looked like a really good blast. Yeah, it was good. I think because I appreciated everything. Um, and I could be really open with, with Czech because when he brought me back, he said, like, I'm thinking of picking you in the World Cup squad. And I said, uh, I haven't played test footy in four years. I don't know if I'm at that level. So each game we review it and say, what do you think? Um, should, I, should I keep pushing or is that it? You're going to pick someone else. And then it only got maybe three games in where I, in the, what was the Four Nations, what is it? The Rugby Australian, Championship or whatever Yeah, that's yeah. it. Um, <clears throat> It got into that and I was like, okay, well, it's up to you now. Like I'm putting myself on selection and then got picked and it was just I was able to be open with him and it's just a really good dynamic. I've never had that with a national coach where I could say, look, the boys aren't feeling what you're doing. Um, Maybe we need to change this up just to be a voice for the players but not have it impact on my selection. It was just a really good time and except for the last game, we are pretty successful. I mean, I suppose you've achieved so much in the game. Do, do you ha- is, is 2015 the final? Is that an itch that you haven't quite scratched? Or again, is it just, it is what it is kind of thing? Well, it is what it is. It's an itch that I didn't scratch. Like I didn't win a World Cup, but I'm not going to win one now. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> so I think I, I had two cracks at it. Um, wasn't able to get there. So it is what it is. It's, it's one of those things where... If you're a good person in rugby and as well as obviously a talented player, that kind of filters down. You know, there's like yourself, Drew, there's guys that I would have liked to have played with and, and, and obviously met in passing, have always been very good. And you hear, you only ever hear good things. It's interesting watching that, you know, the the, the 2015, because that's when you got a concussion, wasn't it? And it's like watching yeah. that. And I knew that that it was coming to the end of your, or your time in the international. I don't know if you'd announced it already. And it was like, yeah. I'm watching it. And I... Obviously, didn't have a vested interest in either side winning, but it's like one of the moments when you see someone that you know is highly regarded and loved and has put so much in to get like a concussion. Even I was sitting on the sideline going, "Fucking hell!" Poor, I remember, I think I was—I don't know who I was watching it with Chloe or whatever. I was like, "Fucking hell!" He's dust. He's like, he's, you know, like, and that was a real kind of for, for a, a person not involved. It was a sad thing to see that that was you were kind of robbed by by just a really innocuous thing because you weren't able yeah. to do what you want to do. And then that's kind of the, the cruelty of sport. But even me as someone who doesn't know you that well, it was something that kind of touched me like, fuck, you know, you wanted to, whether you won it or not, you wanted to have a fair crack at it. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, I think the, the worst thing for me was I remember uh, running off the field and everything was fine. And I was just hanging on the dock. I said, okay, we'll go get this test done. And I go in to speak to the lady. She said, I've seen the footage. We're not going to test you. I said, you've got to, like, please just give me a chance to pass this test. She said, no, like, not even a chance to pass the, like, the test. Like, I was, that was the worst part because if I failed the test, then I failed the test. But um, at least I would have liked to have an opportunity to do it. And I still remember it now. So I don't think the knock was as bad for my head um, as maybe it looked. I think at that point in time, uh, I think I tried to get up too quick and I was too dizzy and I was in the All Blacks um, attacking line, I think. Is what the lady was telling me. I haven't looked at looked uh, looked at it again, but yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, I'm at peace with it. Like I did everything I could. Like sport, as you say, it's cruel, but it can be so good at times as well. 
<laughs> certainly can from from an outsider's point of view. So if I could give you keys to time travel and you could go back and play one game again, mm. would it be a day when you felt untouchable on the on the paddock and you're beating the All Blacks or whatever it might be, or, or would you go somewhere and, and right or wrong? Um, I don't think so. I don't think I'd change too many because if if you change one, it might alter another. I've been pretty okay. like I loved. The games that we won, even the losses that you had, you learn a lot. If I could change any game, then probably the World Cup. I'd love to at least have 80 minutes to compete. That would probably be the the one thing. That's interesting. I've never, I'm not sure I've ever asked you that, Hask, in terms. If you could do one again, what would it be? Well, okay, there's a few things I'd change off the field. I'm not sure I'd change too many. <laughs> we haven't got enough time. We haven't got enough time yeah. for you to redact. I think I'm in the same boat as that, Hask. Um, <laughs> Good. Right, that is what this think... show is all about. But I think that like, interesting, you know, there's uh, you can tell Gitz is a man who like obviously he's watched a few movies on time travel and shit, like talking about the butterfly effect. It's like <laughs> even he doesn't want to like go, oh, if I change one thing, it might mean I might never play again or the world could end. Um good oh, you're a secret geek. I like that. You revealed yourself as a secret <laughs> geek unwittingly there. Um Fine. I don't know. I don't think I don't think I would. You know, I was spoiled in in like early career with Wasps, you know, I was talking to a few people about it the other day, you know, to win, to go to those finals, to win, you know, Heineken Cup, win a premiership at, at 21, you know, to win, to win lots of things and kind of be spoiled and then not get to a final again until uh, the premiership final with Wasps. I think I, if I could change anything to win the premiership final with Wasps again, would have been good, you know, because up until, you know, 10 minutes ago, five minutes ago, we were in the lead to beat Exeter. And, you know, a boy gave away a penalty. We then went into extra time. Then it became a battle. And then, our, you know, our scrum get folded up and we lost off a kick off the scrum. You know, and especially my views on scrums. I don't give a shit about scrums. And I, I can't be... <laughs> I hate them. And the fact that they decide games is very frustrating. So I think if I could probably change one thing, it would be to win that premiership final. Just because it, it would have been nice to have gone back and, and done something and to tasted success again when I was spoiled so young with it. Yeah. yeah, I reckon when you're older, you appreciate those successes a lot more. Like that first one that I won with the Brumbies, like it to me just seemed like this is what happens. And then you go a long period without it and you're just like, like you really, when you're older, like it means so much more. Did Georgie Smith, was he in that team? Yeah, yeah. Uh, was George Smith in that one? I can't remember, but what a boy. Oh, mate, he's oh. someone, <laughs> oh, my God. I Honestly, I didn't know what to expect because he's another one that I like idolised as a player. I didn't quite realise how good he was because I'd never, I, I missed him on the international circuit. He'd moved around and then I'd obviously watched him. And he's a player that I would ask the video analysis guy to send me clips of him, uh, breakdown work, tackling work and everything. So I watched it and I met him. And mate, what a machine. The best bit was, oh. is that he was... A lovely, I think slightly mad, would would absolutely turn up, destroy it, disappear, come in on a Monday, like stink in a piss. And you'd be like, oh my mm. God, like what has this man done? And he'd go away and he'd had one of those um, training masks. He just put a training mask on, sit in the gym and just sweat it out, like screaming his demons into this mask. And then he'd be, <laughs> it'd be fine because he just never got injured. Like he was like invincible. I, I just he was, and also to learn from, like the skills, the technique, the smoothness of his of his movement, the way he conducted things. I loved his confidence. You know, like you just stand up at ten, start putting people through holes. You'd be like, the fuck are you doing, George? He was but the I loved he was it. the one player that Eddie didn't try and change. So he knew that he liked to drink. So Eddie just said to him, he said, George, your decision, mate. You're either going to stop drinking because his weight was obviously, he obviously. His skin folds was a bit of a battle. Uh, and they said, <laughs> you, you've got a choice, mate. You, you can stop drinking and then you just be professional and do everything. Or on Monday you come in, you do your extras and you work hard, mate. And George, trying to do the right thing, said, oh, I'll just, you know, I'll stop drinking. He said, wrong answer, mate. And he just knew <laughs> straight away. He, he, and to his credit, that's exactly what George does. He'd play a game, play awesome, belt himself that night. Next day he's in flogging himself with that mask. I, I think for me, of all the players I played with, like I, you know, I, I was lucky to play with some amazing back row, you know, Lawrence Dallio, Joe Worsley, you know, to, to name a few. But then, you know, I, I idolised Rich McCaw and and but as like an all round good bloke, I think George is a fantastic bloke, but such a quality player. Like at like for me, when I look back at all the players I probably played with, and I forget to say it, you know, you get that standard nausey question: who's the best player you've ever played with or against? Mm. And I think. I think George has got to be has got to be right up there, just you know, or, or right at the very top, because he just did things in such an effortless way. But 
was always so relentless, yet, you know, when you took his shirt off, it just looked like a little builder. But then he was like, <laughs> un- it was unbelievable. And, and, would always give up his time. That was the weird thing, you know, like he, he, the first like two months being there, I go, George, uh, sorry, uh, do you wonder if I could just do some video stuff? He'd be like, yeah, mate, yeah. And then he'd just fucking see him running to the car park. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and people would be going, how, how is, um, how has George really affected your game? And I was like, I can't get him in a room on his own. He won't spend any time with me. He keeps ignoring me. So I eventually like pinned him down after training. And every day I'd be like, George, what are we doing today? And he'd be like, Ugh. Okay, mate. <laughs> and then, you know, he would, he would help me out. But it was quite funny. He was trying to avoid me, I think. You tucked in some quite good hairdos over the years as well, Matt. But I, which was the best of, of the lids you went with? I mean, it was never quite Beckham levels, but there were some fairly flamboyant ones in there. I. Uh, the problem was I had a sponsorship here in Canberra where a lady would just keep doing my hair up and I'd go in and she'd just she started getting creative um, with, like, Chinese letters, like writing winning and all this type of stuff in the side of my head. Which, when you look back at it now, it's incredibly cringe. But at the time, I thought, like, how mad is this? It's got to be done. Man, I've be been done. there. I've been there with the, so obviously when I had a bit more of an extensive lid, I, I well, wasn't one that's slipping off the back. I, um, <laughs> I started to go and see Danny Kerr and I used to go like midweek to uh, this naughty barbers in. Um, what the hell, in Kingston or somewhere like that, right? And we used to go to the old high and tight, you know, like 0.5 and everything else. He was like, do you want a lightning bolt? I was like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a public course. school boy. I'm fucking, of course I want a lightning bolt. <laughs> put a lightning bolt on me. So he put a lightning bolt, rolling with a lightning bolt. All the all the backs are like, yeah, Hask. I think they were probably just winding me up like that, trying to egg me on. So, so we went in there, we went in there the next time and they were like, I'll tell you what, mate, do you want to get a hashtag in the side of your head? I was like, fucking yes, of course I do. Hashtag me, bro. So he like puts like a puts, puts like a hashtag in my head, and I'm like rolling along. Chris Ashton's filming it, Danny Care, everyone's high fiving, and I'm like, this is brilliant. I got a hashtag, and then obviously Stuart Lancaster was coach, right? And can you imagine that he wants his player, especially a gobshot like me, like you know, with a hashtag in his hair? So. As I've got closer and closer to the Penny Hill Park from from London, it's dawned on me that I'm about to roll in with a guy that look, would you know doesn't really approve of anything showy, and I'm rolling with with a 0.5 with a hashtag in the side. So I so I've gone back to my room and I've gone to Doz 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 in the seals like Doz best. I was like, mate, get the clippers out. He's like, what? I said, fucking, you got to shave this out. You got to shave this out. He goes, well, you're, gonna, you're gonna have a bald spot, bro. I said, fuck it, get it out, get it out. So he so shaved the bald spot in the side of my head. So I've rolled into the meeting, right? And obviously Danny Kerr and, and um, Chris Ash have told everybody that I've got a hashtag, right? And I've come <laughs> in, I've got a bald spot. And I was like, lads, don't lie. You know what happened? The clipper <laughs> slipped and the blip came off. And you could see, uh, you could see Stuart Lancaster the whole time in the meeting, trying to like look around the side of my head to, to see if it was true. And like Graham Roundtree came up to us like, uh, what's going on, Hass? I said, listen, mate, went to the barbers, clipper fell off. It's awkward. He went, you didn't get a hashtag, did you? And I was like, no, no hashtag. So I, that was my one bit of risque hair and that, that's fallen out. So I just can't do it anymore. Oh, you'd be able to hashtag the hair now. Um, <laughs> let, listen, the, the other thing that I'd love to ask you about is... Um, what the hell is going on in Australian rugby right now? Oh, I think there's a lot of people that have come out talking negatively about it, but I think for a while it's, um, I don't know, it just hasn't ever felt, there, there's never been real positive chat around uh, the community and especially, you know, when I come back from Japan, you just notice the negative tone around rugby. So what you guys were talking about earlier, like at the very start, I think that would be a great thing for Australia if it just went Australia-based just get them, get the crowds back, get people actually passionate about their area and supporting their area. So I think that's kind of, that, that's missing a little bit from, from Australian rugby and the grassroots now is, um, it's just not a popular sport. So even my kids, they, they don't like rugby. Like they, they don't see it on TV that much. Like they want to play AFL or rugby league. So it's just, yeah, I think they need to get the grassroots right, get it popular again and, and just start in Australia. What does just, cl- what does club club footy look like at the moment? Obviously, if you go, everyone always talks about Ramwick sides of the past and and those. But then, what is club footy like in in Canberra? What is it like in Queensland? What is it like? So, is there is there a would there be a passion for it if you did get it back there? Because obviously, you look at South Africa, they run the Curry Cup. You look at New Zealand, they run their whatever it's called now. It used to be Air New Zealand, whatever it is now. MPC. Um, <clears throat> They run their NPC. But Australia doesn't have that. 
is it just basics to actually get one of those cups up and running again and, and try and get people to understand what, 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 not how good rugby union is just on the field, but what it does for a community off it? Canberra, for example, when we used to have a club team, the Canberra Vikings, they would compete against the Randwick, Sydney Unis. So it wouldn't change the club competition. It might actually. It might strengthen the club competition because they want to play for this rep Canberra team, the Canberra Vikings. So at the moment there's no real pathway because I think the Brumbies have a lot of um, a lot of players outside of Canberra. There's not really that natural pathway through to the Brumbies like when I was when I was here. From a club point of view, it would uh, you'd get say three teams or two teams in Brisbane or in Queensland. Uh, you'd have your five from Sydney, uh, your one from Canberra. Maybe you got your one in in WA, and start to to build it that way. Almost like um, they had an NRC a few years ago. Yeah. But there were five teams or six teams, I think, and I think they lost four me in the first year, and they just gave up on it. I think the next year maybe lost couple million again it was just too much for the AU to lose so you need to find I don't know how it works from a business point of view or how it would look but I think for Australian rugby and to get it popular and the people supporting it again we need to bring it back to to um, just your local team not your local teams but your representative teams in that area. We've spoken a lot on this show about just how rivalry drives interest you know it, it, mm. I think Super Rugby when it came along was amazing it was razzmatazz but now you know the Lions against you know, whoever it is, you know, the Reds in the middle of nowhere with no one in the stadium at an ama- you know, inconvenient time of day just doesn't work for anybody. And yeah. I think I think your point about rivalry would be a thing. What What is going to happen, do you think? I mean, Raylene Castle resigned last week. There, there's been a lot of hoo-ha about the letter from the captains. You know, is there going to be peace at any point or is it has it got to fall <coughs> apart further in order for, for a sort of comeback to start? I don't read too much of the... The media, I don't like to follow it too much because there's so much negativity around rugby, especially in Australia. So I, I like to just leave it and any individual players, like every any local boys around here, I'm happy to help and I talk to them and see how they're going personally. But as far as the business and the ARU and the board, um, how they're going to move forward, I don't know. But uh, I care too much about rugby and, um, and Australia to really – feed into that negativity and follow it too much. So I'm co- probably not that well educated on on the issues with it. So I just leave it and hopefully it's I, – I think if they put it back to a local comp, just Australia base. No, look, I'm not trying to pass the buck, but I really – No, no, I was just, I just, just like missed so one. I wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't saying you're passing the buck. It's just like I, – I, and I completely get it. I uh, Up here there are a lot of people who are – utterly, utterly sick of the wrangling and the fighting and the squabbling. And every week there's a new governing body that comes out and is arguing with a different governing body. It's just, I mean, nothing turns off fans and players and broadcasters like a a, a sport where everybody is backbiting, bitching, fighting for a small piece of cake and ultimately no one's coming out with any glory. Well, the thing is in Australia, you've got so many competing sports too. So you've got your rugby league, AFL, soccer at the same time um, that are now... Past. So if rugby is not popular or it's just got an, a negative tone about it, then then we'll just move on. We'll, we'll pick another sport and we'll get into that because there's so many teams in which wherever you live that you can support. So in a competing market like it is, I think Australia needs to, especially Australian rugby, need to go back to just a, a local comp or Australia-based comp yeah. um, and get those crowds back, get the rivalry back, get people caring about who they're playing for and wanting to play for, for that area. Are people excited by Dave Rennie, who loves the guitar and the post-match and, you know, everyone in a huddle? I've heard good things about him. For, for me, the thing I like most about him is that he's bought, brought coaches that he doesn't know. So you're, you're Scott Wiseman or yeah. but a lot of coaches like nowadays, they'll bring their little crew, even their media managers, to try and help put their spin on things. He's just coming, I think, um, by himself. He may have a medical staff or something, but... To me, it shows he's got a lot of confidence in his own ability and he's willing to get the best people around him that's going to make Australia work. Do you, do you hold promise and hope for, for the Wallabies or do you worry about them? Um, I worry about our game. I think um, the way it's trending, I worry that rugby could be dead in the next couple of years. That's my biggest concern in Australia because wow. we've got so many other sports um, 
and it, the crowds are getting less and less. Unfortunately, you know, it's taken something as drastic as the coronavirus for this to happen, but it might be a blessing in disguise that we get back to just a, an Australian-based comp. God, I tell you what, when, when someone with your standing in the game ends up talking in those terms, I think a lot of people need to sit up and listen. Um, what about you? What's next on the to-do list, other than obviously quarantining for the foreseeable future, but coaching, media, celebrity uh, come dine with me, Strictly Come maybe, Dancing? But, uh, you know what I would like to have a go at? Celebrity, get me out of here. I just think I like Survivor. Survivor's a great game, but it's too tough for me. I don't think I could, right. could handle that. So if I was to do anything... Is that one tough, like sleep-wise? And- it, it, do you know what? It, it's one of those things. If you've been a sportsman and you've gone through a bit of hardship, you've been on a dodgy pre-season camp, you've been with a whole lot of people you've never met before, it's actually not too bad. Like, I, I, If you'd ask me, do I like spiders? Do I like bugs? Would I do any of this stuff? I'd be like, absolutely not. I hate them all. Like, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, if there's a spider in the room, it's going to get dusted. I can't go to bed with it, like, looking at me. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but... Um, and, you know, I, I, I never watched any of the show and I, I watched a bit of like the video uh, on the way to the airport to see the challenges. And I was like this, uh, uh, like gagging, like trying to pull my headphones out. Like sh- the driver was like, you're right, sir. I was like, oh, uh, rang my wife up. I was like, babe, you fucking watch this show. Why, why did you not tell me they're eating like live stuff? And um, I got out there. Do you know what? I found, I found the boredom quite difficult because you just, you know, it, the days are so long. So you wake up when it goes light. And it, you go to bed when it goes dark, and they and obviously all the food is you know it, the food is controlled by them, but the, the portions of food you had in the day were so hard, mate. Like you know, it, I, I, you know, I'm not a complainer, but they also a lot of times in TV, especially the UK version, they think that you know you're eating like they said you're eating 600 to 800 or, or 2,000 calories, mate. I put it in my fitness pal. I was getting 89 calories for an, at least 10, <laughs> 10 hours a day. And, I, and they, won, they wonder why I was like feeling faint and dizzy. They're like, you're just dehydrated. I was like, I've drunk 15 bottle canteens of water <laughs> and some bloke <laughs> off EastEnders has had one half a thing. And, you know, he's, he's like <laughs> passing out upside down. So if you can get around that, it's definitely worth doing and it's nice. But people come out these TV shows and go, it was the greatest thing I've ever done. I discovered so much about myself. Mate, when you've been in a pre-season camp, you know, doing all these kind of stuff, you discover more about yourself doing that than you do. Yeah. Unless, you know, you were doing Like a Survivor or you were doing like that SAS Who Dares Wins program. I imagine you find something out about yourself that. Not not in a jungle. You know, I found out that if you if you put a spider in my mouth, make me eat a bullseye for some food, I'll fucking do it without even thinking about it. Like, do you know what I mean? That, that, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's the test I found. Tim, you did Survivor, didn't you? I did uh, Mission Survive with Bear Grylls, yeah. It was good. And? It was good. It was, but no, I, I really enjoyed it. I, th- I think it was just the right time for me. It was, um, you know, the Autumn Internationals were about to take place. I'd just been to Bermuda on the, uh, yeah, there's one for you, Gits. First yeah, get on the, the Bermuda trip and yeah. did, a, did, a leg- did a Legends tour. Uh, and then I didn't really want to be at home. Well, not that I didn't want to be at home, but I didn't want to be around when all the rugby was on. I wanted to sort of have a little break and not be watching England play for whatever reason in the period that I was getting out of just dealing with it in my head. So I went to Costa Rica for two weeks and yeah, ate some tarantulas, ate a few other things. And, uh, but I didn't want to do the jungle because of, you know, I, I always felt, especially at the time, the jungle was a lot longer. I think it was six weeks, wasn't it, originally? And it just seemed to be portrayed as something where you're waiting for people to, like, snap and have arguments with each other, whereas this was sort of trying to upskill you to be able to survive in the jungle, which is what I had it in my head. And it, and it, and it was good, but you still have those boredom times where you sat around. If you didn't see it, Matt, Hask went from the nation's darling to the nation's punch bag in the space of 24 hours. <laughs> yeah. um, so watch his and then do the opposite and you'll be fine. Did it go for a Guinness World Record like Drew? I reckon you could beat him in a 100-metre clog race or whatever. I, I got one. By passing him the football, I got half the, the record when he oh, made the you? most drop goals in three minutes. He was hitting him like, like a dog. He only had to hit, I think, 20 <laughs> in three minutes. We only just scraped in. <laughs> Unbelievable. I remember you doing that. That was actually on Sky years ago. How many did he get in the yeah. end? He got about four or five, didn't he? Yeah, he got four or five. I think because it was $600 or $1,200 uh, if you want to have a go at the record. And that doesn't necessarily mean – so if you fail once, you've got to pay another 1200 to go again. Wow. So he, oh. he just strapped those clogs on. I think he crushed as many apples as he could in his biceps and <laughs> – 
I think it's <laughs> but when, when you're in France, you just you feel like no one, like this footage isn't going to go anywhere. Like some of the stuff yeah. he did was just ridiculous. He was crying in a nappy one time and it's still <laughs> haunting him now. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. And, and and here endeth the show on, on an image like that. Unbelievable <laughs> yeah. scenes. Um, Matt, it's been an absolute honour, a privilege and a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming to join Cheers, us on the House of Rugby. No, really Stay well. It. Look after yourself. Cheers, um, kids. Good luck with the homeschooling. Lots of gaffer yeah. tape and um, and a quiet mm. cupboard. Pop them in there for a while and they'll be, they'll be good. Well, we must sadly leave it there. So many other things we could be talking about with the ledge, but that is it for this week. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening to House of Rugby on Joe. Don't forget, you can dig into our entire back catalogue, which is on podcast or on YouTube. And you can talk about your favourite bits and pieces and favourite shows in the Facebook group as well. Don't forget to download Sports Pages, the new interview podcast from iTunes. That's on your podcast app. Thank you to James. Thank you to Tins, as always. But most of all, once again, a huge thanks to Matt Gitto for joining us. Stay safe out there, everybody. We'll see you on Thursday with another House of Rugby short. And we'll be back on the main show next Tuesday with Mr. Ben Youngs. We'll look forward to that. In the meantime, look after yourselves. Thank you for watching and listening. And we'll speak to you soon. You've been watching the House of Rugby on Joe, together with Guinness. Drink responsibly. Visit drinkaware.co.uk for the facts.